whenever I'm trying to copyright, I'm not trying to type the best words or, or make the funniest joke or anything like that. What I'm trying to do is communicate a message from my brain to your brain. So when people say copywriting, I think they often think of like a person at a typewriter or something like that. And it's only focused on words. I've never thought of copywriting like that. Let's take a step back of what copywriting is. Whenever I'm trying to copyright, I'm going to use the best medium with the best tools I have at the time. So if we lived in the year 1700, for me to send a message to Chris, I write on a piece of paper and a guy on a horse like brings it over, you know, and like crosses the country and sends it to you. And that's very inefficient, but that's all we had back then. So writing letters and writing words was the skill of the day. Fast forward to now, I mean, we've got phones, we've got videos, we've got audio, we've got all sorts of different things. Now uh, we're on the precipice of like VR experiences. These are all different ways to instill information in people's heads. And so to think that only text is like the ultimate thing is insane to me. So yes, text is important. Yes, text is a lot of the foundation, but I also think making good images is very important. Like you do, making videos is important. And then the compression of information happens over time, right? It used to be to learn something, you watch a two hour documentary. Then we got YouTube videos that were five minutes long. And now you're kind of at the forefront of stuff like Instagram, where in 20 seconds, you teach me something that used to be you read a whole book to learn about a concept about sales that you're teaching. And now you're doing it in 20 seconds. We're compressing information as humans even more and more. And so I want to know what's the best way to communicate information. Is it words? Is it images? Is it videos? All of the above? And I'll do that. That's what I think copywriting is. Do you draw a distinction between what you do and how you help companies and say people in advertising who are copywriters and working on big campaigns? This all gets in the semantics of like a creative versus like who can make the funniest commercial for a company for like the Super Bowl versus a copywriter. What I'm usually doing is the more boring stuff. And, and I don't think it's boring, but it's like, okay, you have a, a piece of software that sells a, an SEO software, research software, and you have a page and a thousand people come to it. I look at the page with fresh eyes and I say, you know what? That, that headline doesn't really make any sense. What if we change it to that? And then I say, you know, this image doesn't convey any information. What if we make it a GIF showing someone typing in how to write on your computer and it shows the results and it, said, and it highlights, write this article. And you're like, oh, I, I understand what your software does now. I go through and just try to optimize it like that. That's it. It's not even that hard. I bet a normal person, if you show them a web page and say, how could I make this better? A lot of people could probably do what I do. This is good because my background is I studied graphic design. And then my first job out of school was to work at an ad agency. And so when I think of copywriting, I think of the art and craft of what they do. There's a ton of copywriters. There are fewer advertising copywriters because there's a whole different art form. It's them spending a lot of time to craft a few words for a very few number of clients. What you're talking about is I get results for my clients, bottom line, through words and images and layout and things like that, right? So I'm assuming you worked in like a big agency? Uh, it was a medium-sized agency. Mm -hmm. Medium-sized agent. Put yourself in like a really, really big advertising agency. Let's say you're in New York working in a big advertising agency, Chicago, somewhere like that. And think about what the actual incentive is for the person making that ad. What they're trying to do is win like a little award oftentimes. So David Ogilvy talks about this a lot. This is where I kind of learned it from and then I experienced it on my own. I didn't think it was real. And then I worked for some mid-sized to large companies and realized it was real. Look where the incentives lay. For me, my incentive lays in, I improved this person's ad campaign by X amount. And they're like, wow, this guy made us a lot of money. We paid him $10,000, but he made us 100,000. 10X their ROI, right? That's, that's my incentive. If you are employee number 1,200 at a company of 5,000, perhaps you have a manager above you and they have a manager and they have a manager. So you're in incentive is every Friday when you go in for that week report is to have a chart that goes up and to the right that shows I did good work or I want an award for this ad. Not that it made the client sales. So oftentimes there's this disconnect with those types of things. And so whenever we're talking about direct response copywriting, it means you come in and have to make more money for that company. That's where my incentives lay. Whereas sometimes for some of those big ad companies like a Ford commercial, they're just like, we want to get a best cinematography award and take the, the most awesome drone shots of these horses running with the Ford F-150. That's kind of their incentive, not that that commercial is actually generating any sales. So that's the difference between de direct response copywriting and kind of creative advertising generally. So there's some clarity here for our audience who's listening because my friends mostly are in the advertising space. They often say advertising doesn't reflect culture, it shapes culture. So they're thinking on a whole different space. It's not necessarily tied to results and metrics and, and things that you can measure. So getting back to you and how you work and trying to help people to understand this, do you set up a baseline of like, 
Here's how it's performing today. These are the results you'd like to get. And then I'm going to work towards getting you those results. Or is it a different process? Yeah. Generally, when I look at someone's site for the first time or whatever it is, maybe a direct mail campaign, you say, okay, what's it doing now? Are they coming to me because they're just trying to optimize it a little bit more? Or are they coming to me because it's not working? And those are two very different things. So as you know, sometimes people will come to me with the, just a bad product and they'll say, how come my life coach page is not doing bad. And I'm like, well, you're not a very inspirational character <laughs> to start with, right? Like, <laughs> Would like, you like, say I, that, I, by the way? Oh yeah, all the time. I feel like it's my obligation if they pay me to tell them the absolute raw truth, whether it hurts or not. And I've said this to people. I'm like, you do not walk the walk. The reason Tony Robbins is popular is because people want to be like him. He's rich and tall and awesome or whatever you know, they think of him. You're not. And this is probably why a lot of people don't want to be coached by you because they don't really want to be like you at all. And so sometimes I, I identify a problem that's not so much the cop. They may have a beautiful web page and they may have a product that promises all these things, but it's kind of the product behind it. That person is not good. Whereas if someone comes to me saying, we already have a great business and it brings in a hundred million dollars a year, could you maybe help us bring in $110 million a year? Well, I look at it and I try to find obvious flaws. And I think the trick is, and you probably see this all the time too, when you're looking at advertising is to come in with fresh eyes. People inside the company have seen their landing page, their graphics, their logo. They've talked about it every single day for the past two years. They can't possibly know how someone like me or you seeing it for the first time sees it. It's like, you know, if you've heard a song a trillion times, it never hits the same as the first time. And so there's something about familiarity that ruins your ability to give critique. And so I come in and look at a page for the first time and I can instantly say, I don't even know what this section says or what is this? Or I think this means that you only serve big companies, not small companies. And they go, oh, interesting. And we start changing up things little bits at a time to see if it, if it makes an improvement. I try to come in with fresh eyes every time and look at people's stuff like, that. And I try to take on clients that are just trying to improve a little bit, not that are trying to improve a failing product. Because oftentimes behind a failing product, there's a, there's some other problem rather than just the copy. When are you having that kind of conversation with them to let them know that they suck, their product sucks? Is this in the first meeting? And of course, like instead of just like talking about it, we actually do these office hours all the time. And I'm not trying to promote the product, just telling you, but we do it uh, every Thursday. So even yesterday, there was a guy who's trying to be like kind of a life coach. He doesn't have like a very impressive background, you know, sorry to say. It just wasn't working. His offers were good. His page was good. Everything looked cool. He had cool photos, but it was just like, it, it wasn't working over time. Perhaps this is a deeper problem than just the copy. What it turns out he was good at, he was posting on LinkedIn all the time. And it turns out people were like, whoa, how are you growing on LinkedIn so much? And so I was like, wait, everyone's asking you about this LinkedIn thing. This is possibly something you could probably sell for more money than your life coaching services. And so we kind of identified where he's actually doing a good job rather than a bad job. So the life coaching stuff coming to me, you know, week after week, trying to make this work, it was like, it's not working that well. Perhaps this is just not the right avenue, but he was blindsided that he was growing on uh, LinkedIn so fast and everyone was asking him, how you're going on LinkedIn. Can you help them with that instead rather than life coaching? And so a lot of times I'll try to spot where people are doing a good job rather than a bad job. In fact, I've actually turned people away from copywriting. You know, you look on YouTube, people are like, oh, make $10 million a day with copywriting. It's so easy, da, da, da. Would be a little bit of a lie, right? And they come to me saying, I'm a computer programmer and I want to start uh, writing copy. And they show me their copy and it's uh, it's not good. It's just not good. They don't enjoy writing. They think it's hard. It's not fun. It's not something they want to do. And I'm like, wait, 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 you're a programmer? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, can you make more money doing programming consulting rather than, you know, copywriting? So oftentimes I'll spot things that they're good at and tell them, have you tried exploring that. People have told me that in the past. I'm sure people have told you, you know, you're actually better at that than this. And so that's part of my job to tell people right away. And I have, I have no qualms about telling them, especially if they're paying me. I feel it's my, it's my obligation. They know what they're getting, I guess, when they sign up. You come from an immigrant family and like, you know, People, people say stuff how it is a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Different cultures speak more directly for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. How long does it take for you to figure out this is probably not your jam and maybe it's more of this? For someone else, you can usually see if they're trying a project that's been floundering for a very long time. And especially if they come to me over and over and I can see that like they're trying things, it's not working. Sometimes I'm like, are, are we missing the picture here? Like some people think it's just because of their sales page and they never really look back and say, maybe it's me. Maybe this is just not the right path. Another telltale sign. And man, I've been guilty of this so many times. You think no one's doing this. So I've got a lock on the market. That often means there is no market. <laughs> Everyone has an SEO agency and you're like, oh, there's just so many of them. It's like, well, maybe because every company wants that. <laughs> there's a big pie to go around over there. Whereas people are like, there's no SEO companies just for people who use MacBook Airs and use white 
white headphones. It's like maybe because there's no demand. So that's a telltale sign. However, the people you know that have a good business on their hands, they come to you and they're like, hey, what's my landing page like? And you're like, wow, this is a horrible landing page. This is terrible. It's awful. How much revenue are you doing? They're like, oh, we sold 300,000 last month. And you're like, with this crappy landing page, you did that much money? That's when I get excited. That's when I start going, okay, even they're doing, they're doing a bad job. And in spite of that, they're doing well. That means they've really hit on the main thing. They got something going and we can optimize the heck out of that. So those are the types of people I look for. It's pretty simple to spot when something's definitely not working. The telltale signs are there, just no sales. They're they're really banging their head against a wall. So you, you generally spot it. Yeah. So the, the lesson there is that you can use marketing to make good products and good services perform even better, but you're really not that interested in marketing poor products and poor services, right? Exactly. I've actually stayed away. Like I had a consulting page for a long time and I just stayed away from doing things like pills. You know, a lot of people market like supplements and stuff to be frank, like a less than ethical way or some vague study that says like this helps your liver and 12 people saw a 2% improvement. It's like, I always listen to that Warren Buffett quote where he says like, assume everything that you do is going to be on the front page of the news. Would you feel good about it? And I like what I feel good about showing my mom that. And so I stay away from those kinds of things. It's just ethically, I can't do it. It just makes me feel gross. It's hard to market those things without just kind of like flat out lying. So I like marketing products that are really good. For example, software either works or it doesn't. You can't really lie. Software clients are my favorite because oftentimes you could just show a GIF rather than explaining. And it either does the job that it's supposed to or it doesn't. It's just that simple sometimes. So I really like products like that that are very transparent. You pay this much a month and you get this service and you can even try it out for free. That Those are my favorite. I've been on your site. No lie, you are a fan of the GIF. There's GIFs everywhere. There's also <laughs> <laughs> interesting stick figures doing all kinds of stuff everywhere. And so you do actually like that. So, uh, okay. You might be referring to my homepage, which has a very old bad GIF. It's not even a good GIF. It's all grainy. And the reason I keep that up there is because it converts between 10 to 12% and every single thing we've tried ever doesn't even do half that. I think it's kind of interesting because you're actually wearing a shirt that says you love copy. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what you're describing to me isn't copywriting, it's marketing, it's it's sales, it's conversion, it's something else. But you like the, the term copywriter, copywriting? The, this has been a longstanding thing that people bring up. They're like, well, what you do is not actually copy. Sometimes I come in to consult with companies or people sign up for us. We're not just typing words. In fact, we're just talking about ideas of how to structure their pricing and things like that. There actually was no copywriting involved. But here's the thing. If I just said, I do general marketing. Like, what does that mean? I say, I'm a dance instructor. That's vague. But if I say, I'm a ballerina, you know exactly what I'm talking about right away. And so a lot of times people come in for the copy stuff, but leave with all the general marketing. So I always found it better to specialize rather than just say vague marketing. How do you describe what you do? Basically, I tell them I'm an, I'm an educator and content creator. And I help uh, creative people who have business problems. But if you were said you were a graphic designer or that you help people through graphic design, it makes it a little bit more uh, punchy. And I've always found whenever I've tried to move away from the word copy, because I've had this thought before, I'm going to say, I just help people with marketing. It's so vague. It's difficult to have those conversations because they're like, well, what do you, what do you do? Where I was like copywriting, they're like, oh, he'll improve a, an email. And then you could expand on that once they understand the general concept, right? I didn't actually just go into copywriting saying that like, I'm going to start out as a copywriter. I didn't like niche down right away. It's actually the universe kind of told me, right? People told me, the market told me that like everyone wants to hire you for this thing. People pay the most money for this thing. People know you for this thing. People want to hear your opinion on this thing. Whereas if I just talk about general marketing, it seems to not get as much interest. So it's almost like the world told me to do this rather than I picked it. Okay, you talked about something about making small changes to a landing page or a sales page until you can optimize it for the results that you want. You're getting into, I think, split testing. Is that what you're doing? Um, not really. One of the things about split testing, it, we do do split testing to a degree, but these numbers can often lead you astray. Split testing for your audience is like, you know, you test one headline that says Christo is awesome versus Christo can help you with your marketing if you're a big company. And, you know, how many people click that sign up button right below it? And so I'm assuming that second headline where it's a little bit more specific would work better. So that's the kind of stuff we're doing. We're just trying to improve each headline so there's no confusion. A lot of times we'll come to these SaaS products and they'll say, this product is a fusion between technology of AI and, and, and human design. And you're like, what does that mean? And instead it says, this is an AI copywriter that will write blog posts for you. Sometimes just being more obvious. And sometimes people will, in a big company, especially if there's a big boardroom full of people writing copy together, um, it ends up being this jargon that, that makes no sense. And so people will come to us asking for that kind of thing. And uh, we can immediately tell them if uh, they're doing a good job or not. And we can often just replace their headlines 
and start going through and just making things clearer. We don't always have to split test everything because think about it. You come to a software company's page, the headline's a little bit different. It's not going to change the page 80% necessarily, but each little incremental improvement will make it better and better and better. So we used to do a lot of split testing, but you have to have he very heavy traffic for split testing. And also just remember, split testing was very popular when a few years, like 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And the reason is you basically got an eyeball on a page and that's it. Like you couldn't communicate with your customer. Now you know this very well. How do people follow you? They follow you on Twitter. They follow you on Instagram. They follow you on your blog. They follow on YouTube. They maybe see you an ad. They maybe hear about you from someone else's Twitter. It's almost impossible to track all that stuff now. There's some basic ways, but it's almost impossible. So we can hit people up in so many different ways that to say just the homepage landing page is making that decision for them. No, that's false. If a good friend of mine recommends a software, no matter how bad the, soft, the page is, I'm just going to buy it. And so those things matter more and more in today's world. So we want to optimize your page the best we can, but to think that just your sales page is the thing making the difference, I don't think that's the case anymore at all. You have so many different ways to hit up your customers and educate them and they hear about you from other places that all that stuff is very important also. And having a relatively optimized landing page is important. So we don't do a lot of split tests because it ends up spending a lot of time like changing colors of buttons and split testing headlines and things like that. In fact, I would implore you, if you have a business and, and you don't believe me on this, try something interesting. The best way to split test stuff is through email, if you have an email list. So if you send out an email with one subject line that says Neville Medora podcast versus one that says Chris Doe podcast and see which one does better, that might have some influence, right? But then people really, really stress like, should we say this is a podcast by Chris Doe versus Chris Doe has a podcast? It's just split, like splitting hairs over here. If you do what I call an AA test instead of an AB test, test the exact same email subject line on your email list, you'll get different results. Try it. See what happens. An AA test, you're saying... What's the difference then? Nothing. T split test the subject line. Hey, here's my latest podcast versus B subject line. Hey, here's my latest podcast. The same subject line will often get different results just because of natural variations in like, you know, audiences and things I like see. that. Yeah. This is to disprove the fact that split testing even works. It's like you're doing a double placebo. So if we use my name in the your email subject line versus yours, your audience knows yours better, it probably worked better. So split test would work there. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But a lot of people split hairs so much. I'm just saying if you AA test, you'll be like, wow, that didn't really make a difference. You know what the best uh, indicator of open rate is? The sender field. So imagine that my mom sends me an email. She's not really good at subject lines. I'm still going to open it, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter what the subject line is. I, I want to hear from her. So that's the most important thing. Your sender reputation over time, in my opinion, is the most important thing. Subject lines can vary from here to there. And overall, you'll end up every single company that I see, I get to see all their, their analytics. It's almost, they always get almost the same open rate. So the hustle gets almost the same open rate every time. The AppSumo gets the same open rate. My emails get the same open rate every single time between like 28 and 38%. It's always in that variation, no matter what the subject line. So when you're writing the copy and your team is working on this stuff, you just go by, this is what we know it needs to be. And how are you making those decisions? I think it's experience and keeping up with the current trends. You could see certain things. I mean, if you remember like in 2012, time frame to then 13, there was all these links with like uh, upworthy.com that were like, this guy did 12 things. You won't believe what happens next. Or an alligator went in this guy's yard. Look what happens. And it's some like underwhelming video. At the time, those types of things were king. I mean, if you're stuck in that era, you'd be writing these spam articles that that social media kind of bans now. Like actually, you don't see those headlines because they, they are actively demoted on social media. And so you have to keep up with trends. And so what I always do, I have a whole separate email account and we have like a, a tool that collects all the email marketing stuff. And we try to see which companies are growing. What are they doing? What are they sending out? What kind of format are they using? What kind of content are they sending out? So try to keep up with current trends. And then also we get to see behind the scenes of so many people's businesses in our community area that we can kind of see what's working. So for example, it used to be you write these incredibly long, the longer, the better five, 10,000 word articles. What you're actually seeing is Google is like, you know what? People don't want 10,000 words. They just want you to summarize the thing. And so what you're seeing is a lot of the first page results on Google are actually pretty like short to medium articles. They're not that long. And so if I was stuck in, you know, a couple of years ago, I'd say you should write this super long article with everything under the sun about this topic. Now I'd say, actually you should write just, you know, a summary of it. We keep up with trends like that to see what's working, what's not working, what the current trends are. That's how we kind of keep a pulse on what's working. And also, you know what? Sometimes we're wrong, but usually I can say I've seen a trend that 
no one doing this thing that you're doing is doing well anymore. So I can say that I'm confident. For example, B2B emails, people used to write these really long ones. And I can almost assuredly tell you that the longer it is, the worse it's going to do. Because that's what I see every single time, almost without exception. So I could kind of make, I'm not saying it's a general rule, but at the time, if you send a really long email pitch as a cold email, it's not going to do as well as if you send a super short, maybe one to two sentence one. Well, that kind of parallels something, an observation you made earlier, where it used to take a lot of information, a long time to communicate an idea. And whether it's our shrinking attention spans or we're just getting better at communicating because we've had a thousand tries at it versus writing a newspaper article once a month. We just have more tries and we have quicker feedback cycles and now we can communicate quicker. And it's quite interesting to me because I don't follow any of this stuff. And so this will probably be useful for audience listening in that there was a period of time when content marketers would tell you create 10, 20,000 word essays and the more the better for, for Google. But what we're learning is it's now figured out utility to user. So if they send you a link that you don't actually get through, what's the point? And so we have to be better at communicating more efficiently with fewer words. And those are the articles that I generally read too. So as a consumer, I'm echoing what your observations are. So it's not that Google made this change that things should be shorter. It's actually why were long form things more uh, popular 20 years ago during the beginning of the internet. And the reason was it was hard to log onto the internet. Things were super slow. Right now we could of course click a million tabs and it's fine. It just happened so fast. Imagine it was a hundred times slower because that's what the world was like. It was so slow and difficult to load up a web page to start your computer, to log on. It was hard to find internet. Your browsers were slow. It didn't have as much capability. You could barely even watch videos a couple years ago. And so at that time, it was very rare to be able to pull up a web page. In a web surfing session, you would go through maybe five to 15 web pages. Now we're probably going to like, like a bazillion, like your computer is hitting up APIs of thousands of companies at the same time. So it used to be much harder. So whenever you pulled up a piece of information, I wanted it all in one place. But now if I want to look up uh, how to fix my door because it's squeaking, I go on TikTok and type it in and I get the, the quick and dirty, right? Because TikTok videos are going to be 20 seconds. Like here's how to do your, get some WD-40, da, da, da. And I'm like, perfect. I got the high level overview. But then if I really want to get down into it, I could go to YouTube because I got some extra time and I really want to know how to do this correctly. And then if I want, I guess, I can read an article about it. So I have different modalities that can I can pick and choose. I remember a few years ago, I was cooking an egg and I was like, I don't know how to make a sunny side up egg. And so I typed it in YouTube and there's 14 minute videos popping up. And I was like, the egg's on the thing, right? I, I need to learn right now. And so I just went to Instagram and typed it in. There's like a 10 second video of someone how to cook an egg. And then later when I had time, I can go watch Gordon Ramsay cook the perfect egg, but that takes 25 minutes. I think there's different modes nowadays that we can uh, view. So do you read 10,000 word articles on you know how to cook an egg anymore? No, but you might watch two YouTube videos or two TikTok videos very quickly. So there's just different modalities and things change as technology improves. I wanted to ask you a question about your entrepreneurial journey from uh, high school, college, and up until now. Has it been smooth sailing for you this entire time or have you had some, some setbacks? And if you did, what did you learn? Fortunately for me, it was, it was relatively smooth. It was never really like that bad. Like I never thought I was going to go broke. I always thought I had like enough savings. There'd be months where I didn't make as much money, but I always had like backup savings. So I an, entered as a computer science student because I was interested in computer science, but there were 17,000 people going for 5,000 computer science spots. This was during the tech bubble. So everyone wanted to do computer science and I was not on the right side of that curve. So I didn't get into the computer science program. So I said, what else do I do? Political science, going to maybe to law school or something like that sounded interesting. And during that I was studying with like a business minor and doing political science. I actually was running a business since high school called houseofrave.com. I don't even know if it still exists. I was running that and it was very unusual for a student to be running a company back then. And I was actually making money with all these different side projects that I was running. And I joined all these entrepreneurship club. And, and Chris, believe it or not, back then, there was like 200 people in this entrepreneurship club I was in. And maybe two of us had a business. That's not a good ratio. Now, if you go to a college, almost all of them will have some sort of hot side hustle or have sold something on uh, Shopify or something. So it's, it's really increased, but back then it was not super common. And while I was running these companies, I was starting to learn. I was like, okay, I can see the near future. I have a lot of family friends that are older than me that have exited college, that have gone on to jobs in investment banking and all these different things, law, et cetera. And I would talk to them and it didn't seem like a lot of them liked their jobs. Not all of them, but some of them were like, yeah, being a lawyer is not fun. You're pushing papers for like dumb documents all day. Like it's a little bit soul sucking. And I was like, wait, this is what I kind of want to become. This sounds bad. <laughs> I always thought by being an uh, in investment banker, 
banker or something like that sounded really cool. It sounded cool. And like you make a lot of money. Then I talked to a lot of friends that were investment bankers and they're like, wow, this is kind of like indentured servitude. They promise you $400,000 a year. They actually pay you $60,000 a year with the promise of a gigantic bonus at the end. And if you don't do what they want, when they want, how they want for even one second, they will pull that bonus. I was like, wow, that doesn't sound great either. And so as I was running these companies, I was making a pretty competitive what, what I could make in the workplace salary as a college student. And I was like, well, if I could keep doing this, it seems like the upside is unlimited. The downside is I moved back in with my parents at worst. And even then it probably won't come to that. And so I always thought, man, I'm young. I could just go get a job. I'm pretty confident I could get a job somewhere doing something. And so I chose that route and I was already making money in college. So when I exited, I was like, well, why get a job? It, did, it didn't really make sense. And so I had to kind of explain that to a couple of people like my parents. But when they saw that income was coming in, they were more OK with it. And yeah, so my college degree didn't necessarily help me, although the college experience did. You could kind of uh, make your own path if you want. Yeah. OK, so you're in a very rare space where you're making money. You have beginnings of a career. You're still in school. And is it your parents like pushing you to kind of finish school or because oftentimes when people are in this situation, they just drop out and like, I'm going to do my own thing. No, I don't agree with that sentiment. So a lot of people say like, oh, Elon Musk is a dropout. Bill Gates is a dropout. Mark Zuckerberg is a dropout. Elon Musk was going to pursue a PhD at like Stanford, right? Bill Gates was was doing really well. These people weren't dolts that just dropped out and just thought like, let me try something. They actually started something. And when it got so big, they dropped out. So little hometown hero over here is, is Michael Dell in Austin, Texas. He lived in the the same dorm that I did, not the exact unit, but the same dorm. And he was selling computers and making so much money that he had to drop out. He didn't want to, but he had to drop out because it was too much going on. That's the kind of dropout that you want to be if you're going to drop out. You don't just want to drop out and say, I'm going to find something. I always say like, if you can't do it on the side, you probably can't do it full time. So people think like, oh, only if I had more time, I'll be able to do X, Y, Z. And I think you've seen that many times that like, if you can't do it on the side, it's probably not going to work out full time either. So I actually think it's kind of dangerous for people to drop out full time, have unlimited time on their hands to do do nothing, motivation, and uh, just flounder there. So if you're going to start a side business, start a side business. And then if it gets big, then you drop out of your job, your college, whatever. You did the very adult and responsible thing by sending that message out so that young people listening to this aren't going to just immediately drop out and cause all kinds of heartache for their parents and <laughs> potential future self there. I get that. It's like you want to leave for a reason, not because you don't know what you're doing, because that would seem like a recipe for disaster. Oh, can I, can I tell you a quick story about that? Where my yeah, of course. Uh, about how my parents kind of accepted it for the first time? So yeah. obviously making money on the internet was a weird thing back then. It's hard to imagine, but back then- What no year one is this, money. by the way? This is like uh, 2001. And so 2001, I'm, I'm entering college, making money on the internet. My parents are like, by the way, it's not just my parents. No one knew what the hell I was doing. They're just like, are you a drug dealer? How are you making money? Like, what, what is this? Like, they had no idea. And so it was a novel thing. It seemed like uh, being a YouTube influencer 10 years ago as a career. It was like, <laughs> it, it was nuts. People are like, you're going to make weird videos on the internet. And like, you know, people still had dial up and weird things. It was just a different era, right? So I was on this, the precipice of something new doing this. So people didn't understand it. And I remember my parents were said something. They were like, if you don't make a certain GPA, we're going to make you pay for your college this semester. And I didn't hit that GPA. I missed it. And I wrote them a check for the whole semester. And they were like, wait, whoa. What? Like they, they didn't think they didn't think that would happen when they finally realized like, oh, perhaps this is something real to someone who's just going to leave college. I would say if you already have some path to success, you've already got some small success, you could show to your parents like, hey, look, I'm not just like abandoning college because I'm lazy. I actually think I genuinely have a ton of upside and I have a couple of months of savings or a couple of years. And if something bad goes wrong, like I can live for two to three years with no income. So I told that to my parents and I said, you know, I don't have large expenses right now. I'm, I'm young, I'm living cheap and I can live for about two years before I go broke. So I think that quelled their fears and showed that I was motivated rather than I'm just dropping out and I want to be X, Y, Z, but have no modicum of success so far. And I think there's always times when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, man, I suck at this. I'm not doing as well as my friends. Like, of course you have that. This is my personal thing. I think you should be between 10 and 30% discontented. And I actually think the number should be higher if you're younger. So if you're 20, and don't have a lot of money and kind of relying on your parents still can't pay for your way in the world, you should be relatively discontent. I need to work harder. Like this can't be my life my whole life. I need to work harder. And then as you grow older and you buy a house, you have more stability, I think you should have more and more contentness. So you actually notice this with humans, right? Young people are always like, we got to break the system, change everything. And they're rebelling. And then older people are like, you know, let's just go with the flow and ride this out, right? That's just a normal ebb and flow of how uh, 
life goes. So I think you should always be happy for what you have, but partially discontent. You shouldn't be fully content, I think. Like a little bit of discontent is good. Yeah. You're always trying to improve. You're always trying to keep up with the times. And so I always think it's been like that where I was doing good. And there's times when I was like, whoa, I'm noticing revenue slipping. You know, that's not good. Like, is this the way I'm going down to zero? And so then you feel bad about yourself and you think, crap, I got to get my stuff in order and I got to do something better. And so you have to harness that energy. That's the world telling you, like, you're not going in a good direction. You got to change this up. And I had that a couple of times in my life, like with uh, House of Rave, I was a drop shipper. And so back in the day, that was like a brand new idea. Like, whoa, I sell things online, but then someone else fulfills the orders, right? That was a new idea. But then people started catching on, right? And there was more and more middlemen just like me. And then Amazon, Big Bad Wolf started coming up and selling stuff way cheaper than I ever could. And you know, you got to admit to the world, like this company going up faster and faster is going to really hurt me. There's more sellers just like me. There's more competition. Our profit margins are going to go down to zero. Where am I going to be in five years? I'm going to be working way harder, making the same level of money or even less. And you have to like analyze at that point, like, is this going to be a viable business anymore? Like in five years, it's going to be really hard to compete like this. So I need to start changing the way I do things or looking for something else. And so there are points in, in time like that. I've had a couple like that, but I've never been in like dire straits or anything. Fortunately, I've always had like enough savings and things. I think there's a Jim Rohn quote on this where he says something like, be happy with what you have while you work for all that you want. And so I think that's your formula. Like we don't want to be displeased because otherwise we're going to enter into a state of depression and never content with every anything that we have. But be happy with what you have and then work for all the little bits and pieces that you want to have. I also think if you're working on something fun. It makes it interesting. Sometimes I tell people, I'm like, ah, I didn't do anything today. But then in reality, I did like, a, I did this interview. I did all this work. I wrote something. And I'm like, I don't think it's hard because it's something I naturally like to do. Kind of like what you do. I kind of see it in your content. You kind of enjoy what you do. It sounds like you think you're just messing around all day, but at, at people are like, wow, that's a lot of work. And you're like, well, I didn't really feel like work. I was just, wrote, you know, talking to, to a camera for a little while. Like <laughs> that, that's probably, if it's probably fun for you, you know? And so I think that's like the greatest blessing in life to be able to have something that you like doing. So so what I found early on is I liked writing online, even when it was hard to do and no one made money doing it. I thought I would just do this forever for free and it would be cool. And then later on, it turns out you can make money at it. So I was like, oh, even bonus, like this is what I get to do. So, you know, there's a lot of times I'm just writing a blog post and people are like, what'd you do today? Eh, and then just wrote a blog post. They're like, that's work. I'm like, doesn't feel like it though. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Five years from now, with the way that um, AI and machine learning is doing its thing, I understand there's some services that there's AI based copyright. Writing. Are you concerned about that? And do you see that potential? Concerned? I love them. I'm invested in them. Yeah. <laughs> I've invested in one called Copy AI. And there's another competitor run uh, by one of our friends here in Austin called uh, Jarvis, although I think they rebranded as something else. But there's a lot of these great ones. And then Dolly 2 just came out from OpenAI, which is like an image generator. So graphics designers, you know, they, they, they get a little bit scared about this because you can just describe something and it creates it. And then you can iterate from there. What this is, is like, like I've talked about, the person that's living in the year 1700, if they're trans transported to now, all they have is the technology of writing. So they're behind the times because people like you and me can make images and videos and transmit our ideas in different modalities. So similarly, it's going to change. It's going to get better. The reason I make money right now is because it's hard for people to sit down and write good copy that's succinct. But computers will replicate that. They're getting better and better and better at doing that. So what that means is the average business owner, instead of having to pay Neville a bunch of money, will say, you know what, let me just push this button and it'll just kind of like give me a bunch of ideas and I select which ones I like. That's kind of going to be a new way of writing. So a lot of copywriters is a big debate in the copywriting community. It's like, oh, these computers are going to take our jobs. It's like, yeah, if you're a sucky copywriter that just sits there and doesn't adapt with the times, it will take your job and it well should because it's doing a better job than you can and it does it a million times faster. However, someone like me who's like, whoa, I got to harness this. What that tells me is I can actually do my job instead of for 10,000 people, I could do it for a million people with the help of these machine tools, right? It's similar to people in journalism in the 70s or 80s that were like, oh, stuff on the internet. That's insane. Like newspapers are always going to be king. And then the people that were like, well, newspapers are good right now, but this, I mean, you could distribute an article to everyone on earth with digital. Like maybe we should at least try that. Those people flourished and the other ones floundered. So the people that embrace the technology do well, the people that are scared of it go down. So I think if you actually use these AI copywriter things, you understand their limitations, what they can do, what they're good for. So for example, little AdSense ads where it's like two headlines, they're fantastic for that because it could generate so many and you can be like, oh my God, I never would have thought of that. Let me click that one. Writing long form blog posts, they still are horrible. They're not good. They can make kind of spammy blog posts for sure, but they can't write really good ones. I know where this limit is of technology 
technology and what I should spend my human time on. And then when the image generation stuff comes uh, out, so it already has, like with Dolly 2 from OpenAI, I can start saying, I love using images. I love using GIFs. What if instead of drawing out each GIF and it takes a long time to edit in Photoshop frame by frame, what if I use Dali to make that image? That saves me so much more time and I can come up with fun and interesting creative ideas and output articles and videos and stuff much faster than I could before. So I can output way more using these tools rather than being afraid and thinking like, oh, it's going to take my job. Whatever you're doing right now in 20 years, it is probably not going to exist, especially if you're in the digital world. The way that you're making videos right now with Instagram and stuff is going to seem like grandpa's old stuff in 20 years. This is going to be completely outdated. And that's just something you have to accept. I plan on hopefully adapting with these tools and growing better because of them, not saying like, oh, it's going to take my job. I think that's a kind of a loserish way of thinking. <laughs> 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 All right. So if you feel threatened by AI, you're a loser. And well, I, I just think it, you you just scared. What what if you what if you say this tool is available for me? How can I use it to amplify right. my skills? I, I, I hear a, you. Right, better approach. Yeah. Right. So AI can empower you to do what you do even better. So embrace it. It's not going to go the opposite direction. It's only going to be more and more intelligent and and dare I say, even more artistic in how it does its job. So you have to stay on top of that, top of the food chain. I'm mindful of time here. I know I want to ask you this question because I saw it on the top of your Twitter feed and also on your blog post, stupid email. Explain that to me. <laughs> the stupid email means swipe thought, uplifting, picture, interesting, and drawing. I know that off the top of my head because I have to explain it so many times. And every Friday, I would, I would post on social media all these short form things. And I thought, you know, it's kind of a waste that I feel I find all these cool things. I'll make images, I'll make drawings. I'll take time to write a thought, which, you know, as you know, it takes time. And then it just goes nowhere. And so what I did was I started compiling all those things I was sharing on social media into a newsletter. Turns out this is my most widely well-received newsletter I send out. And we send out quite a bit of email. And every Friday, roughly at 7 a.m., I send out a thing called the stupid email. And it's an acronym. I mean, swipe that uplifting picture, interesting job. So it's a swipe. So I like all these old ads. You can't see it right now, but from this angle, you can. I have all these old Ogilvy ads, their top performing ads up on my wall. I love old ads like that. It's like old music. There's a lot of crappy ads, but we just, you know, focus on the good ones from back then. It's inspiring to look at them. I like them. A thought is just some interesting thought I have. Interesting, something interesting. And then a, a picture. I like picture. I share pictures of myself on social media and stuff like that every once in a while, much like you do. And I'll share a picture, something personal, right? I'm at a conference or something like that. So you just shared a bunch of pictures of you in, uh, I forget which European Croatia? country, maybe. Uh, yeah. And yep. you had, you had this awesome round table, uh, speech that you gave, mm -hmm. like that would be the picture. And then a drawing, I do a lot of drawings. So I'll share a drawing, a GIF, something like that. And what I tell people is if you want to create your own newsletter, that's like this, what you do is you look at like the last 10, 20 things you share on social media and you say, huh, what's that called? So maybe it's like business advice. And then maybe you share a couple uplifting quotes and then maybe share uh, silly things all the time. So I would say make the bus email, you know, the business uplifting silly email, something like that. It's called a backronym where you back into an acronym. And so that's what I did with the stupid email. And it's a horrible name. I actually, I don't think I'm very good at naming things, but I thought, you know what? It's, it's stupid. It's funny. I like being stupid and funny and I'm just going to do that. So could it have a better name like the, the slick email, the swipe email? I'm sure it could create a better name for it, but I just like stupid. And it's just funny. People will be like, yo, I love your stupid email. And, and they, they just get a kick out of it. And so, yeah, I think it's a bad name, but it's a fun name. So the stupid is an acronym for prompts for you to send out a weekly newsletter? Yes, it helps a lot because if you had mm -hmm. to create five things every single week, I mean, it's right. not easy, right? To come up right. with five unique things like that in addition to our normal workloads. And so I just have a swipe so I know where to find swipes. I go to uh, Reddit slash vintage ads. Um, I have a couple different places that I keep them. And on my desktop, I take screenshots of stuff. And then on my phone, especially, I, I browse a lot on social media. I take screenshots of stuff at the end of the week or on Thursday, I'll go through my phone and my desktop and say, okay, I like this uh, ad on my desktop right now. I have a Citroen ad, old Citroen ad from the seventies that I'm going to post uh, next week. And then I have a bunch of uh, social media quotes and stuff that I found that I thought were interesting. And on Thursday I go, eh, that's interesting. That's not interesting. And I kind of create it from there, but having kind of a format to send out makes it so much easier. Whereas if I had to create a completely new newsletter every Friday, Oh my, that'd be a lot of 
That'd be a lot of work. Is there a narrative thread that's going through these different letters like swipe and thought? Are they related or are they totally unrelated? This might be a loose thought, but I remember hearing like why Joe Rogan was so popular back in the day. He was like this weird amalgamation of a guy that liked, you know, psychedelics and then monkeys and MMA. And then he was a TV guy. It was, it was just a re- really weird combination of things that was very uniquely him. And I thought, you know, these are the kinds of things I post. I post a lot of old swipes. I like this kind of stuff. So I thought, this is kind of uniquely me. If it's uniquely me, then I just naturally do this. So I thought I would just send it out and see what happens. And it turns out people like that. I wasn't sure that people would like that format, but I knew that whenever I share individual things like that, a swipe, something, a thought, something interesting, a picture of me, people like that stuff. So I thought, what if I smash it all together? That'd be a nice format. And so a lot of people have taken note from that. I made a post called how to make a newsletter because I was part of you know the Hustle and AppSumo and all these companies that have 2 million plus email newsletters. And so I know a little something about it and having a format to follow each time is very important. And you could also find a format that's uniquely you. You don't have to copy mine. Yours could be co- completely different. So for yours, it would be like a graphic or a, or a business thought or a, a, an Instagram carousel each time, you know, something like that. If I wrote a newsletter every week, but yes. If you did. I mean, I think you put out enough in, uh, information on social media that you could totally compile that into a newsletter. You're doing all these little small things here and there. Why not put that into a big newsletter that people don't follow you all the time or a little overwhelmed with their own social media don't see? So you could just follow my Twitter and see all the same information in the stupid email. Not everyone follows everyone on Twitter all the time, right? So they get this weekly newsletter and they're like, oh, I missed all this. This is great. Yeah. What I find interesting about your process is that it's so personal and it's quite eclectic that you get a sense of like, I'm I'm crawling into your mind a little bit in this email. And like, if you like that and you enjoy that, of course, you're going to look forward to these emails every single week. And it is so uniquely you. And I think in this kind of cookie cutter marketing and newsletter that everybody does, we can get tired of it pretty quickly. So well, let me tell you a quick anecdote about that. So the D in stupid means drawing, right? Because I do a lot of drawings. I have a whole history of doing drawings. So I have tons of them in my, my media folders. So I changed that. I was like, you know, drawings is not as educational. I'm going to do do overs. So I changed it to do over. And what I did was I was going to do over people's Twitter profiles. I was going to do over people's emails. And we started doing that for a while. And people are like, yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't care. Like I'd, okay. I'd post that stuff on Twitter and they were kind of like, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's okay. So I just kind of like redo someone's Twitter profile and they were like, yeah, it get five likes. And I was like, you know what? People just didn't like it. I didn't like doing it. I found it very difficult actually to find like relevant profiles. So I was like, you know, I'm going back to the drawing. That's me. That's what I do. It's, it's easy for me to create drawings. If you tell me to make some stupid little stick figure drawing, crank one out in five seconds over here. But to do over a Twitter profile, it takes a lot of brain power. Yeah. I have to find someone who's letting me redo their profile. I have to tell them to test it to see if it does better. Honestly, the, the audience was like, yeah, we're tired of seeing you redo random people's profiles. It just doesn't resonate. So I thought, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go back to whatever's uniquely me. And that thankfully did better. I've been guilty of the same. You think this is going to really resonate? It's a lot of work. And then it just falls really flat. And you just go back to what works. Totally true. I'm sure you get that feedback loop very quick on Instagram too. Okay. I have two questions for you. One semi-serious, one totally goofy. You strike me as a guy who likes to tinker and to mess around with things, to kind of hack your way through stuff and make your own rules as you go. I saw this video that you put out on YouTube about like how to get your tweet to go viral. And you broke it down very thoroughly from beginning to end about this one tweet about Elon Musk and a 21 second pause. And you got so much engagement and impressions on this. I'm curious if you've applied that to other social platforms where you've kind of hacked your way through it to get explosive growth. I'm curious. Well, no, here's the thing. If someone knew the exact secret to going viral every single time, they would just be at the top of the world. So there's people that are probably far better than I am at it. I just said how I did that specific one that when you look back on it, like even when I show it to people, they're like, I can see why this went viral. They can totally see it like the, the way I put the captions, the way I put that timer there. And here's the other little trick of that one. It was a pause where uh, Lex Friedman, a great podcaster, interviewed Elon Musk, a great interviewee. And he asked him a question about when are we going to get to Mars? Elon Musk paused for a full 21 seconds. Now think about that. Like if we just went radio silent for 21 seconds on an audio podcast, everyone thinks that the the, the video and the audio froze. So people were watching this timer and they're like, is, is my phone broken? Like, what is this? I think it, it tapped into all these different things that made it go viral. And I thought I would just break it down to show what I did. And you know what's funny? I copied that exact same process on a couple other things. It didn't work as well. I, I think that what, what goes viral 
constantly changes, right? Someone says those upworthy style headlines do really well, like, oh, 12 things you won't believe. You got to click the article. Those do well for a while. Then people start distrusting them and then they don't do well for a while. So there's this constant cycle of what goes viral and what doesn't. So I bet the way that you've done, I think you put out a post recently about carousels, carousel about hashtags. They used to work really well, then they didn't work. Now they work again. It was something like that. So things change all the time. And so I broke that down. I thought it'd be a fun piece of content. It was interesting to go viral and see like, man, what is Elon Musk's Twitter feed look like? And it felt like every time I click my notifications, you just get like a hundred more and you're like, oh my God, like this is like living in a different world. And so I thought it'd be fun to just share some of that stuff. But can you constantly hack your way to the top? I think there's actually a different way and it's more boring. So someone like Mr. Beast, I think goes viral all the time, but he has a whole network of friends and people that he hits up for every video and says, hey, can you reshare this? Can you reshare this? Can you reshare this? And he actually manufactures the virality by his network. And then also they, they spend a lot of time on their content, et cetera. But it's, it's very difficult to consistently do it. And even he has flops. So I don't know if there's an answer to that, how to do it every single time. You might actually, you seem better at social media than I am. So you probably are the person to ask, not me. So this is quite fascinating. The stats on your Twitter should have gotten you in most social apps, a ton of followers. And you said it told you you got like 29, but you calculated maybe 600 or so. And it's quite fascinating to me because on most social platforms, when you go viral, you're a subscriber follower account. Twitter is one of these weird black holes where you can see someone that have 2 million likes and have a thousand followers because it's not a culture one where we like one tweet and we're going to instantly follow that person. Well, also, if you think about it, the tweet was more about Lex Friedman and Elon Musk and not Neville. So they're like, well, I'm going to follow Neville. Now, if they kept seeing good interview clips like that and liked me, maybe they would follow. But yeah, you're right. Also, I did get a lot of subscribers from it. It was a little bit indirect. So from that tweet alone, this is the Twitter stats said I made 29 followers, but the engagement was millions, right? Uh, 3 million plus at the time, maybe more now. But what happened? was I definitely did get 600 plus followers that day or two. So what happens is people would click my profile, go to other tweets and then subscribe. I'm not exactly privy to that, exactly how they calculate that, but I'm suspecting it's something where if you don't subscribe directly from that tweet, it doesn't count. Do you do uh, live audio spaces? I've done some clubhouses when that was kind of popular during the pandemic. I've never done that as much. I I'd encourage you to do it because um, obviously you have a lot of opinions and ideas about things. And if you can do live coaching, which you've done it with your community, what's really interesting about live audio that's unique to the other platforms is there's not a lot of places for you to hide. Meaning if you're someone who is of substance, who can speak about things, in a coherent way in real time. When you do these live sessions, really you're going to get exposed for being great or terrible, but it doesn't really go both ways. So pseudo coaches, ones who uh, have copy pasted some kind of formula, who've propped themselves up, they tend to be exposed really quickly. Not that that was their intention. Someone would go up on stage, all of a sudden something would break out and there's some controversy that would ensue and quickly the word would spread that you know they really don't know what they're talking about. So for me, doing an audio only experience, just like working with people, come up on stage, we'd talk. I started to grow my following, but more importantly, people into my community. It was the largest growth period I've had. I think when we were doing the pro group at that time, we we're probably under 300. Now we're over 670 people. And a good portion of those people came in through the live audio experience and they're still there today. I haven't experimented that much with it. Yeah. I, I enjoy experimenting with all the social platforms. It's fun. I did not really realize that was a thing. If you want to, because it can be a little intimidating at the beginning, Twitter spaces and LinkedIn audio events, which they're called. If you're interested and you have a topic you want to do, I will host the room. That way it's easy for you. You can jump in and, and you can shine in the way that you can. So I'm just putting that out there if you want to do that. I'm totally game for that. Also, I didn't even know till this very second that LinkedIn audio was a thing. <laughs> It's a relatively hot and contested space with no clear winner yet. And so no one's going to concede this just yet. And it's a unique experience. And I thought a lot of it as being initially, because I was close-minded about it, that it was like a poorly produced live podcast. But it's the ability to have a real conversation with someone in real time and to think on your feet. Think about like how comedians are on the stage and doing crowd work. There's not a lot of places for you to hide. You either can think on your feet and tell a good joke or you can't and you're going to be exposed. Night is like verbal warfare almost. Yeah, a little That's, bit. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't wow. have to be that aggressive, but yes. Yeah. That's a bad term for it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you, you, you're going to uh, find out if somebody's the real deal or not really quickly. So people are interested in copywriting or just hearing about your ideas about marketing or copywriting and conversions. They would probably get a lot of value and you'd probably get quite a few people interested in at least signing up for what it is that you do, either your newsletter or your course. I would love to try it out. Usually the reason I haven't done audio as much is because whenever we do copywriting consults and even our office hours, it's always better to have video 
in there also. So I'm not saying that I haven't done any great podcasts about copywriting, but a lot of times I want to show people rather than just tell them. So instead of saying, hey, Chris, your, your website sucks on video, I can just say, let me bring it up and let me change this headline right there. Oh, you do right? it live right there? I, I do it live and I use a little JavaScript trick you could see on my site that I use all the oh. time. That can just edit your website, not actually your website, it's just on my front end browser, right? right? But I can say, what if you put this in there and I literally type it live and people go, I get it. Whereas audio, unfortunately, mm. I have to say, imagine Chris's website, it's blue, right. it has a picture of him and it's, <laughs> he's pointing at his head. It's, it's a little bit more difficult I get uh, it. to explain sometimes. On Twitter, as you're doing a Twitter space, you can pin links. So what people can do is first they'd have to submit whatever it is, their sales page for you in advance, you and I as the host of the room can pin specific ones that you like. And we can also pin a separate tweet with a link to you editing it live so people can listen to it while watching you. If you can share a browser link somewhere, and if we can see it that way, then, you know, I don't know how you can do that on a technology level, but if you can do that, no problem. Obviously, you don't want to be described. Move, if you can imagine 10 pixels to the right and this color green, that would be a horrible audio experience. Yeah, but I've done a lot of podcasting, including this one, where we talk about copywriting. And you don't have to actually be redoing copy right. on, on the spot, right? You can talk right. about concepts and different things and stories. Yeah, I think that could work well for yeah. you. You can say, well, here's the thing. I'm confused by this message. What is it you're trying to sell? And why are there so many words here in between this and that? And I would do it some like this and you would describe it. And this is where your audience is going to lean in and say, wow, Neville just did that live. Imagine working with him or enrolling in the course because you get to do that thing that magicians do. It's like you just do the trick. The not so serious question that I, I think it's appropriate for us to end the podcast on is this. You're a little bit of a scoundrel crashing parties and you describe the whole process in bloody gory detail. I'm going through it like, oh my God, this is like everything in there. Are you still crashing parties, Neville? I can afford to go to parties now, so I don't generally <laughs> crash. <them. laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good answer. So you're going legitimately now? Yes. It's also, I get invited to more cool stuff, right? When I was like 20 and not getting invited to anything because I was a nobody, not saying I'm a somebody now, but I have a little bit more clout. I wanted to meet like rich people in their in their natural environment. I would go to every conference I could and there'd be some that I couldn't afford, right? $2,000 for a conference, I could do it now. But back then it, it was inconceivable to spend $2,000 when I was 20. That was like my, my maybe part of my net worth like or maybe more at the time. There was no way to go, but I was like, I want to go. And so I would find ways to go. I remember I would say, can I get a press pass? And then I remember I had a mentor named Robert and he would go to all these fancy parties that I, I never even heard about them. This whole circuit, probably in what, if you live in a reasonably sized city, there's probably this whole fundraiser circuit of rich people that get together. It's probably between 200 and 500 people that come to all, most of these things. And they're getting together all the time. Every week there's these events going on for fundraisers. They only invite rich people because they're the only ones that can, you know, shell out $20,000 for, for things. And these things exist. Exist. There's this charity foundation. The first one I crash had Elton John as a private concert for 200 people. I show up, everyone knows each other. Me, this little brown kid who had shitty clothes, didn't even own like a real suit. I looked more like a waiter than anything actually. And I remember thinking like, I got to get into this. this. This seems awesome. And I had to learn on the fly. I was pretty nervous to talk to people. I had to learn on the fly, just under pressure to be like, like make friends. And I would crash these parties and be forced to talk to people. My trick was I would go to the bar line and they, had, they would always have open bars at these things. And uh, there'd be like a a little bit of a line. And I'd be like, Hey, I'm Neville. How's it going? Man, these lines are long. Like that was like my opening line. <laughs> and then I would chat to this guy and his name would be Bob or whatever. And then he would know other people. And he'd be chatting with me. And then Bob would say, Oh, Hey, uh, meet Phil. And he, this is a uh, Neville. And so this Phil guy thinks I belong at this place. And I would keep working the room like that and meeting people and asking them questions about what they do and all sorts of stuff. And just kind of networking that way. And I would say like, now I would hate doing something like that. At the bottom, I was so curious about people's lives that this was a way to interact with them directly. And also at the time, we didn't have the same level of podcasts and YouTube and stuff we do now, but there is nothing like meeting people in person and having private conversations that aren't recorded, things like that. And, and it was a fantastic way. And I met a lot of these people. And I was like, could I buy you a coffee at some point? Like, I just like love to know more about your story. And a lot of people would be so happy to do it. The richest guy I met owned a chain of carpet stores. I, I thought like technology was my whole world. And I was like, this guy's way richer than everyone I know. He runs carpet stores. He sells carpet. <laughs> That's it. Wholesale carpet to big companies. It's it's like things like that I learned. And I thought the crashing uh, party thing was very valuable. And it got me inside rooms that I never would have got into. I, I met like the prime minister of Malaysia. I don't know if I actually ever published what, exactly what I did, but like we did some scoundrelly stuff to get in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I got this picture with the prime minister of Malaysia, <laughs> like a security around. And people were like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then I sat next to Michael Dell. I hung out with like Lance Armstrong while watching Elton John. I mean, like these are crazy experiences I had by crashing parties, uh, which is a 
you know, kind of a weird thing to do. And I haven't done it in a while, but I probably could. If you read my posts, you'd know exactly what I used to do. And it, it still totally works, by the way. Any parties you can't get in, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how to get in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's pretty wild for, for an introverted kid like myself, even thinking about that, because I'm super square and like follow the rules and all that kind of stuff. I could not even do that, but I admire that someone can and has written a whole blog post about it. Here's the rationale, because because I used to post this online and people give me flack about it. They're like, you're crashing a charity fundraiser. This is supposed to go to kids, da, da, da. I get it. I understand that that point of the, the argument, but here's the thing. I also thought I want to ner- learn how to become wealthy and, and better off. So one day I could also give back. Let's say you consider it stealing. I stole $2,000 or something from this charity. Let's just say that's true. Overall, I've given a hundred times X back already and plan to a lot more in the future. And so that was kind of my justification for it. So whichever way you see it, I saw it as crashing a party and it's silly. Some people saw it as stealing. I'm not, I'm not really sure which way, which way to look at it. Both can be true. I thought it was a value add to those parties. I met people and later on, I actually gave back to a lot of those charities too. Gray area, sure. <laughs> Grayish, I mean. <laughs> Gray area, for sure. Probably more black than gray, but you know, I think you saw it as a challenge. I want to challenge myself and who do I need to become and how do I get way, way out of my comfort zone? And if people have issues about this, you just read the blog posts and you're like, oh my God. I mean, it takes a lot for a person to be able to just walk in there like, you know, you own a place and, and you get to meet people. Like I can't even talk to people who I know. So this is a, a huge challenge, right? Well, you know what I found out? I would crash parties with friends sometimes. A few times, some people would do it with me. And then what happens is it, it's kind of awkward when you don't know anyone, right? We would just end up talking to each other the whole time. And that's why I would go alone because I'm like, I need, I'm need. i here to meet other people. I have an objective. I'm crashing this party. I need to meet other people. I can't just chat with my friend the whole time and drink free booze. I do view that as a little bit kind of like stealing. You're just going in and kind of drinking booze and uh, eating their food and leaving. To me, that didn't justify it. Whereas if I met a lot of people, I'm like, I feel like there's some greater good here. Absolutely. Like we just accidentally walked into the talented Mr. Neville Medora here. <laughs> <laughs> you're conning your way through everything in life it was game that was your past you've given back righted a potential gray wrong maybe who knows it's all good now we'll see what, what kind of comments we get on this part now whether or not uh, we uh, wind up doing an audio space event room together in the future it doesn't matter I've had a uh, wonderful time chatting with you I think our audience has learned a bunch of things about copywriting not over complicating things learning how to communicate and for people who want to find out more about you Neville where do they go you just type in copywritingcourse.com you'll be greeted by a funny gif that converts at 10 to 12% all the time. Uh, sign up for my email list. That's the, the best way. You could also follow me on Twitter at NevMed. And then uh, copywritingcourse.com, we have like this community where we actually just rewrite people's stuff. So if you have a business or you're a freelancer, you come in, show us your stuff, and then we rewrite. We have a whole team of writers. And every Thursday, I actually get on a video call and we just actually live redo it, chat about stuff. And like you said, Chris, we don't just do copy. It's a lot of other stuff. It's like overall marketing. And uh, maybe if your product sucks, I'll probably tell you to your face. I'll try to be nice about it, but I'll be direct. <laughs> I also have a book. This book will teach you how to write better. Oh, and you're going to die. Yeah. I don't really talk about that one that much. That's my as part of probably my life philosophy. That was just a fun one I did. I have to say, if you need help with copywriting, if you want to sharpen your copy, if you want to have a more intelligent conversation with your copywriter, pick up this book. This book will teach you how to write better. And if you want to learn about Neville's life philosophy, you're going to die. It's pretty straightforward. You will die. Slightly dark, but funny way of looking at life. You're going to write better is 95% of people like you're going to die. 50% 50% of people like. So uh, <laughs> be warned. <laughs> Keeping it real. Neville, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. You too. It's fantastic meeting you, Chris. Thank you so much. Hey, my name is Neville Medora and you are listening to the future.